I am here live with uh, Aditya, somebody I've had on the show before. You've already met him before. Uh, somebody who's a very good authority on Kashmir and a very good source on what's going on in Kashmir. So there's a lot that I um, we're going to try and get through today. But before we even get started, first, just let me welcome back to the show. Aditya, call. Aditya welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Sham. Really happy to be yet again with you. Yeah, on the show. Yeah, so um, it's it's serendipitous that you ended up on the show today because you know quite a big news broke uh, today. I woke up and I saw it on all over news as well that uh, Yasi is finally being sentenced uh, to yeah. life imprisonment. Now uh, I want to get your reaction on it, but I think a lot of people were you know upset why he was not hanged. And I believe that is because the case on him was not the terrorism that he case was more about like terror hawala financing, right? And for so for that, death penalty wasn't on the table to begin with, or was it? That's right. Uh, you know, from the beginning of this particular case, uh, you know, we'll have to make the clear distinction here. Huh. Uh, firstly, this particular case is hawala terrorism case, which means hmm. that illegal money came in from Pakistan through the Pakistan ISI and the terrorist groups like lashkar e -Toyba. And that money, that illegal money, terror funding money, uh, came into Yasin Malik through terror conduits who were arrested mm. only in 2017. So this NIA took cognizance of this in 2017 and, uh, you know, had a case registered. And there were massive raids that happened simultaneously in the Kashmir Valley on several terrorists. I remember on a particular day, there were 40 to 50 raids that took place. Wow. There were several separatists jamaat e islami elements uh, and these you know businessmen conduits who were arrested both from delhi as well as from kashmir and mm. subsequently yasin malik's jklf was banned in 2019 and he was later arrested in april and right. since then this case has been going on this is not the original terrorism case that is pending against him in 1990 uh, mm. so there are two important cases that are pending for the last 32 years imagine against yasin malik wow. and these cases are one of killing of Four unarmed IAF officers, including squadron leader Ravi Khanna, on 25th of January 1990. They were standing outside a bus stop in Rawalpura, area of Srinagar, unarmed completely, when Yasin Malik, along with three to four of his, uh, you know, terrorism uh, days colleagues, so as to say, of JKLF, came yeah. in a gypsy along and a bike and, uh, you know, asked Ravi Khanna for a way to a particular location. The moment Ravi Khanna, you know, came towards the gypsy, they came out with their revolvers and AK-47s and pumped bullets. 27 bullets were found inside the wow. body of Ravi Khanna. And three other junior officers of Ravi Khanna were also killed on the spot. Uh, later, you know, you know, another case that is pending is the kidnapping of Rubia Saeed, mm. who is the daughter of uh, Mufti Mohud Saeed. And uh, she was kidnapped by JKLF, by Yasin Malik and his colleagues. And later, she was released in exchange for five dreaded terrorists of JKLF who were released by the government of India uh, for her right. to be set free. So these two cases are pending in a special Tada court, which is now called the Special CBI Court of Jammu. Uh, and there's been no end to the trial, to the hearings that are still taking place. And God knows how many more years uh, that will take. But this is a case of Hawala transaction that in which life imprisonment has been given. In fact, there are multiple sections against him. So for multiple sections, there are multiple, uh, you know, uh, awarding of sentences that has happened today yeah. uh, in which two life sentences have been given to Yasin Malik. Subsequently, a 10 years imprisonment has also been given and a fine of 10 lakh has been imposed as well. Uh, mm. You know, after studying the kind of crime he did and his financial status right now. So these uh, imprisonments will run concurrently. That means he has got life sentence. Yeah. So that is the basis of this entire case but Yasin Malik is a self-confessed psychopath killer uh, mm. you know for years he was being shown as a Gandhian as a Nelson Mandela of some kind uh, for some uh, people Che Guevara but the reality is that he's a cold-blooded murderer uh, you know for instance for two minutes I'm, I'm still ready to believe that Gilani and uh, Mirwai Zuman Farooq and Shabir Shah are still separatists or radical separatists 
or extremist. <laughs> but Yasin Malik does not fall in that category. He is a dreaded terrorist. Uh, he has killed innocents, not just Kashmiri pundits and Indian Air Force men, but he has killed Kashmiri Muslim women as well. So let's yeah. remember that. And uh, so, you know, he has to face gallows. That is what should happen. Uh, for the kind of crimes he has committed against humanity, uh, the least is death sentence. That's what Indian law says. It's the rarest mm -hmm. of rare case. And the judiciary needs to see the kind of impact his terrorism has had, not just on the Kashmiri Hindu community of Kashmir, but on the Jammu and Kashmir as a whole, uh, on the country as a whole, on the mm -hmm. Indian constitution, the parliament and the democracy, the kind of impact his terrorism has had. So this is certainly rarest of rare. And a public example needs to be made of this particular case because India over the last many years, at least for the last eight years, has shown spine, has shown that uh, you know terrorism cannot be tolerated. So this needs to be implemented in letter and spirit also. And that will only happen when Yasin Malik is hung uh, right. as per the law of the land. Yeah. And with regards to that, you know, you were talking about how in his JKLF organization, terrorist outfit, they were, they've killed so many people. They've obviously IAF soldiers and not just the IAF officers, but also, you know, innocent Kashmiris, both Hindu and Muslim. So is there not a case that has been built around his activities with JKLF? Like what has been, is there not enough proof that's available or there hasn't been enough political will to build a case around him and the activities of JKLF? Like why has only the terror financing Havala aspect being used in sentencing him? You know, for that, you have to study the entire last 30 years of what happened. Uh, the political instability, uh, the failure of New Delhi to not just arrest and convict Yasin Malik, but instead provide him a platform. You know, Yasin Malik, during the trial of this particular case, said something very interesting. He said, people believe that I have met Dr. Manmohan Singh, the Congress leader and the Prime Minister of that time, in 2006, but that's partially true. So Yasin Malik said that it isn't just, uh, you know, uh, Manmohan Singh that he met. He also met VP Singh. He also perhaps met IK Gujral, and he also met Atal mm. Bihari Vajpayee. So there was systematic failure. Consecutive, mm. you know, uh, governments that were in power in New Delhi provided Yasin Malik shelter and platform. And you know, for for this, of course, uh, Yasin Malik is absolutely true that he met all these prime ministers. These prime ministers provided him an open field and open platform, uh, run amok and, you know, mm. uh, campaign, uh, you know, plead his case of so-called separatism from India. Uh, imagine. And, you know, there were intelligence yeah. agencies also supporting him during that time. There were perhaps the intelligence bureau who was in touch with Yasin Malik and his ilk and providing him not just monthly money and stipend, but uh, all his medical expenses, all his, all his luxuries, were taken care of. All his flight yeah. costs, traveling costs, hotel costs, medical expenses, everything to the T were being, uh, you know, looked after by the intelligence agencies of India. And not just India, why just India? Pakistan as well. Now yeah, for Pakistan, course. one can understand that Pakistani deep state is supporting him just like they have done with Gilani, Mirwais and others. But why was India trapped by mm. Yasin Malik for years together, at least from the mid-90s, uh, to about uh, 2014 or 2017. Mm. So this is a case study. And that's why I repeatedly say that you need to carry out an audit of your mistakes in Kashmir Valley. And you have mm. to name names. You have to name people from the intelligence agencies and the uh, politicians, you know, who carried out this entire thing. It can be, mm. you know, uh, it cannot be just intelligence bureau. Uh, it has to be politicians, both from the Congress, the BJP and the Third Front, who were responsible for it. Who were those politicians? Yeah. Who were those... Uh, bureaucrats and intelligence agency, uh, you know, security experts or IPS officers who were responsible for giving him platform. Here is a cold-blooded murderer who on BBC goes on and says that I challenge you. I challenge the Indian state that you arrest me. You take action against me. Yes, wow. I plead guilty of killing, uh, you know, innocents in Kashmir. Yes, I plead guilty of kidnapping people. Yes, I plead guilty of Indian Air Force men. He called it armed struggle. And wow. even after that BBC interview in the mid-90s, there's been no action uh, whatsoever. Only this financial irregularities and terror financing case in that too in 2017. Mm. Why not act in the murder cases, the cases of terrorism against him? Now, even yeah. if Prime Minister Modi is in power today, and I'm glad that abrogation of Article 370 has happened, I'm glad Yasin Malik 
and separatists are in jail. I'm glad that Jamaat e Islami and JKLF is banned. Yes, all credit to the current government and the prime minister. But why not, you know, do a basic thing and yeah. uh, put the Yasin Malik case into a fast track mode? You know, he is seen as the symbol of terrorism uh, by not just Kashmiri pundits, but now uh, the larger country, the larger vote base of Narendra mm. Modi sees Yasin Malik as a terrorist who is responsible for, you know, expelling mm. Hindus from Kashmir and for launching these uh, Islamist terrorism movement in the Kashmir Valley, just like yeah. the ISIS has in Iraq and Syria. So. Prime Minister, the BJP, and the government will have to act. If they speak about Naya Kashmir, if they speak about no tolerance towards terrorism, this case of Yasin Malik needs to be made a test case. That Indian democracy, the Indian constitution, Indian secularism will not tolerate such terrorism, will not tolerate such terrorists. And when justice can be done partially, at least in the anti Sikh riots case of 1984, even after these 40 years, yeah. why not in the cases of terrorism in Kashmir? Why not? Does it give you any hope that, you know, chalo I understand, you know, I understand the anger that uh, he hasn't been sentenced to death, but at least we know today that he's going to, he's not coming out of that. At least we know that today. Does it give you any hope that other people like Yasin Malik, who were, you know, hailed as these people, revolutionaries, they were just fighting for their political and cultural and religious rights and nonsense like that. Other people who were out there who participated in these killings, who participated in facilitating terror in the Kashmir Valley, that some kind of action will be taken against those people? You know, uh, Sham, for the last 16 to 17 years, at least for me and perhaps for others even more, I have been trying to build uh, this case against Yasin Malik. You know, even in either in the public narrative or before the investigative agencies, or before the government. You know, I've been telling initially in my college days as an activist and later as a journalist, that, you know, here is a case where you need to act. It's an open and shut case. There is evidence, there are eyewitnesses, uh, CBI and all agencies have everything on Yasin Malik. Then yeah. why not take action against him? So there were protests organized all across New Delhi, all across other places, asking the government to act. But the Congress government at that time did not act. Uh, yeah. provided a platform. Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government did not act. And we had hoped that Prime Minister Modi will act. And kudos to the current government that they have changed the perception of the people when you know it comes to Kashmir. They have created, you know, a great amount of change in the Kashmir Valley uh, with, you know, the arrest of all the radical elements, all the prominent mm. radical elements who were stoking fire, instigating fire across Kashmir Valley. They have been, you know, arrested. Uh, stone pelters are not to be seen. Even today, when the case was being pronounced, we saw a small protest in Mesuma area where Yasin Malik resides in Srinagar, Kashmir. Yeah. And there were hardly, you know, uh, 10 or, you know, hardly 12 people who were seen at that protest. So even in the bastion of Yasin Malik, uh, you couldn't collect 100 people for a protest in support of him. That gives you, that's, that's a picture for yourself. That gives you the real picture of what's happening in Kashmir. So yeah. I think, yes, uh, it gives me great hope. Yes, it gives me great satisfaction that the perception has changed. The policy of the government has changed. No tolerance approach has been shown. But this needs to be uh, at a level of consistency. You know, mm. uh, yes, it gives me great satisfaction that at least Yasin Malik has got life imprisonment. You know, we will have not have to see him now uh, being paraded in several seminars and conferences in Delhi <laughs> where he was doing an open platform and called Youth Icon. Even yeah. unfortunately, by several uh, top media organizations, uh, by several yeah. activists, by several writers and so-called intellectuals, you know, from India International Center to Gandhi Peace Foundation to India Habitat Center Habitat, yeah. to to, to uh, Taj Palace in. New I Delhi. remember very very clearly oh, yes. as well that some uh, when I was at Hindu in in Delhi University, he went to Habitat to do some something with Arundhati Roy or something or the other or one of those people. And two or three people from my college also went. I'm like, Why are you yeah. ke liye? To bolte, Are, nahi yaar, he's, a, he's a freedom fighter in Kashmir. Ka, he's a freedom yeah. fighter. So that was a perception. You know, yeah. um, very interesting uh, anecdote that I'll tell you uh, about the India Today conclave that happened, uh, I think, somewhere between, I think, 2010 or 11. Or, or was it 9? Uh, I may be wrong. So this was in Taj Palace and Yasin Malik yeah. was invited. There was a huge protest going on from Kashmiri pundits outside the venue. 
and he was being shown as a youth icon with several other prominent actors as well as industrialists and i was there outside protesting as well and uh, a big business tycoon of india mr anand mahindra was hosting that panel discussion mm. and he invited him as a ray of hope as a youth icon as somebody you know who was given up gang and it talks about you know gandhi's um, and peace and uh, recently you know after yasin malik's case came to you know uh, was highlighted i tweeted that video and uh, anand mahindra back then had blocked me on twitter and suddenly <laughs> after this video there was a huge uproar and people commented and uh, mr mahindra then unblocked me and sent me a message and then we had a long conversation about what happened but uh, yeah. you know this is what it is that you know uh, people who were protesting against terrorism victims of terrorism were arrested mm. for raising their voice victims of terrorism were you know subjugated uh, by a certain government at that time and a terrorist was given open platform he was you know uh, boasting about his designer suits that he used to wear yeah. you know he has that he has this uh, you know uh, kind of a propaganda where he used to take people uh, to a mud hut a small kind of a hut in kashmir and say that you know i don't have money i don't have everything this is how india keeps us and you know we are running this struggle from here but yasin malik yeah. has huge property where did he get all this property wow. where did he get all the money from he got all the money yeah. from pakistan so this is how the ordinary kashmiri muslims were fooled by yasin malik as well who thought that you yeah. know here's here's the robin hood here's our uh, you know sheikh waira who is going to you know turn kashmir into some kind of a you know divine place for them uh, with an islamist role in sharia but this is not the reality he was just earning his money he is yeah. illiterate he does not even know uh, you know spelling of democracy so yeah. you know uh, i mean he's not he, it's very clear from the get go that this man and his ilk had no interest in democracy they had an interest in sharia and they had an interest in you know uh, putting sharia getting like an islamic state in kashmir that's the only interest in that even the even this drama of uh, democracy how people did not see through it from the get go it it's such a crazy chapter i feel like in indian history that people like yasin malik were able to bamboozle the indian population or the indian media either willingly or the indian media was willing to be bamboozled by people like this which one is more true but it's just it's a shameful and but an incredible chapter in indian history as well it is absolutely shameful you know not just india today we have this huge aapki adalat show that mr rajat sharma did with yasin malik you know why was this terrorist really being provided this platform i still don't understand you know everything is in public record that you know he has confessed to his crimes there are terrorism and murder charges against him that are pending in a court of law but here he is being shown as this kind of an icon for years together by media mm-hmm. by politicians by activists by writers by human rights groups and not a word by these so called human rights groups and uh, human rights defenders on what crimes he has committed against humanity so mm-hmm. this is of course a very sad uh, chapter and uh, there is no accountability you know yeah. nobody asking any questions nobody answering and those who uh, need to answer are silently watching are mute spectators today do not want to comment even do not want to support yasin malik imagine yeah. you know today they have hidden completely those people <laughs> that provided platform to yasin malik and told him he is our leader he is this and that yeah. and those people are missing completely from uh, you know interlocutors that were formed uh, by government of india who gave all the stage and platform to yasin malik and asked government of india to have negotiations with yasin malik the same guys are completely missing today why are they afraid yeah. if they had so much courage if they had so much of uh, wisdom of seeing yasin malik as a ray of light why not come out today in his defense yeah. and speak up why not protest outside the court why not go to lal chowk and protest this is the hypocrisy that i'm talking about and on the other hand you know we have uh, propaganda from the across the border we yeah. have people like shabash sharif bilawal bhutto imran khan almost in unison as if ispr has provided them all the tweets of what yeah. they have to do with shahid afridi also ha huh. yes yes sir ji ko kaam dhanda hai nahi aaj kal life mein kuch yeah to shahid yeah. afridi is now probably wanting to enter politics full time uh-huh. that's why uh, tweeting but uh, one thing is mujh katane there i was aane wale hai sir yeah. Yeah. yeah so ye ispr ka propaganda hai yeah. ye in sab ka chalta rehta hai ek danda basically hmm. kyunki kashmir jo hai pakistan ke liye ek matra issue hai 
they do not have any other foreign policy goals you know india mm. may want to be a superpower india may want to be an economic giant india may have a huge capability of having a self reliant defense industry india yeah. may talk about uh, atmanirbhar nirbhar bharat and vaccine maitri india might be invited to global uh, you know forums like g7 united nations and several others uh, and just uh, completed the quad summit but yeah. pakistan ko ye sab se lena dena nahi hai pakistan to pata hi nahi unko foreign policy unki kahan ja rahi hai kaise <laughs> bilawal bhutto abhi uh, tony blinken antony blinken se mila yeah. aur usko ye nahi pata mere ko pakistan ke jhande ke sath khada rehna hai ki america ke jhande ke sath khada hai <laughs> तो ये तो अभी उसी यू नो दुविधा में और बेवकूफी में जी रहे हैं yeah. तो पाकिस्तान के लिए तो कश्मीर एक ऐसा एक इशू है जिससे वो पूरी पॉपुलेशन को बेवकूफ बना सकते हैं तो yeah. जब इलेक्शन क्लोज होता है अब एक साल में इलेक्शन होने वाला है पाकिस्तान में सो दीज गाइज आर हेल्प बेंट कि कश्मीर इशू किसी तरीके से चलते रहे यही बिलावल भुट्टो जो आज ट्वीट कर रहे हैं यासीन मलिक के सपोर्ट में जिसने yeah. इमरान खान के लिए कहा था कि यू नो कश्मीर की पॉलिसी इमरान खान की ऐसी है कि पहले हम सोचते थे कि कश्मीर कब कब्जा करेंगे और कश्मीर पे हमारा झंडा कब लहराएगा और आज हम कहते हैं कि मुजफ्फराबाद कैसे बचेगा मुजफ्फराबाद <laughs> इंडिया कब्जा ना कर दे मुजफ्फराबाद पे सो so, ये है ये आपस में ही बढ़ते रहेंगे या आपस में ही मरेंगे लड़ेंगे और इंडिया ने बहुत अच्छा किया ये जो स्लैंग मैच होता था इंडिया पाकिस्तान के बीच में एक हर चीज के ऊपर लड़ाई हर चीज के ऊपर ये इंडिया ने बोला कि नो वी डोंट वांट टू यू नो गिव यू दैट मच ऑफ क्रेडिबिलिटी यू डोंट वांट टू एंगेज विद यू एट ऑल यू वांट टू डाई यू वांट टू पेरिश यू वांट टू इकोनॉमिकली क्रम्बल यू वांट टू सपोर्ट टेररिस्ट एंड यू नो द गन एंड द स्वर्ड दैट यू सपोर्टेड यू विल डाई बाय इट यू कंटिन्यू विद दैट डेथ मिशन वी वी आर नॉट गोइंग टू फॉलो वी हैव आवर ओन फॉरेन पॉलिसी गोल्स वी हैव आवर ओन नेशनल सिक्योरिटी गोल्स वील फोकस ऑन दैट So yeah. that's why you see a ceasefire now between India and Pakistan. That's why no talks are happening right now. No mm. trade is happening right now, and Pakistan's economy is completely, you know, uh, gone for a toss. So yeah. you know, this kind of propaganda that Pakistan does has failed globally. They are now organizing a protest outside the Indian mission in London, <laughs> and there are these puppets of Pakistan, several Pakistani origin MPs who are trying to rake up this Yasin Malik issue. now inside the house of lords and the house of commons but nobody is going to say anything and there are in fact british lawmakers and british parliamentarians now coming up and saying that article 370 was an internal issue of india why should we yeah. comment on that and the british foreign office should not indulge in this kind <laughs> of a rhetoric and uh, you know if uh, uh, you know uh, yasin malik is important issue then why not the killing of minority sikh and minority shias and minority mm. ahmadiyas and hindus and christians in pakistan raise those yeah. issues those are much superior superior and interesting and important issues so this is what is happening globally i think uh, the us has realized that pakistan is uh, you know a waste of time that's why you know imran khan did not receive a single phone call uh, from biden yeah. uh, they have uk has increasingly realized although they have a huge pakistani diaspora that's why they do the balancing act yeah uh, that's true for other european nations as well but i think us I mean, and look, un have... like labor labor party jo hai wahan ki they seem to be just leaning yeah. into the sort of pakistani diaspora this indian diaspora to haath se nikal gaya to these guys that's right so yeah. there's a huge pakistani diaspora and of course the labor guys who are hell bent uh, on raking up this issue kashmir issue without realizing uh, what the root cause is what about islamist terrorism what about the minority killings what about the kind of uh, this kashmiri politicians having a hegemony and jammu and uh, you know ladakh not getting any space all these years so these are socio economic and political issues that they don't bother about they just go by propaganda and the same yeah. is true for human rights groups like yeah. amnesty international and human rights watch who have never cared about minorities who have never cared about hindus and they just uh, have been supporting this separatists all the time so i have no hope in them anyways mm-hmm. but uh, it's important to speak about them and you know tell them and show hold the mirror to their face yeah important to discuss what they're doing because you know the what has ha- happened in the yasin malik case we can consider that a partial victory let's say for in, for kashmiri hindus in particular for jammu and kashmir but at the same time i think to cement that victory and to turn it into a complete victory rather than a partial victory i think we need to also talk about what has been going on in kashmir 
and why Kashmiri Hindus have been protesting over the past few weeks in Kashmir as well. So this is a known fact that ever since Article 370 was abrogated, there has been targeted killings of Kashmiri Hindu lawmakers, Kashmiri Hindu government employees, and not just Kashmiri Hindus, but also uh, Kashmiri Muslim shopkeepers who dare to, you know, run their businesses in the Kashmir Valley, like, you know, try to return to normalcy. Kashmiri uh, Muslim policemen who are just trying to defend Kashmir from uh, from the terrorists that, you know, that are attacking civilians in Kashmir. That has been happening. That targeted killing has been happening for a while. And recently, the killing of another government employee, uh, Rahul Bhatt, happened, who was was given employment in 2010, I believe, under the migrant scheme. I think he was given employment. That's right. And so the Kashmiri Hindus are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Kashmiri Hindus are uh, protesting, saying, you know, sending us out back into Kashmir like this, with no protection, with no plan of what is what is to be done with us, is just turning us into cat cannon fodder. Like, we're eating ducks here. Hamare paas koi protection nahi hai. Koi bhi kabhi bhi hamare office mein ghuske, hamare dukaan mein ghuske, humko maar sakta hai. What is the point of this existence where we're living in constant fear ke hamare, you know, papa, chacha, taya, jo bhi hai, kal ghar aayenge ki nahi aayenge. And uh, um, that is a very important point because until and unless Kashmiri Hindus feel safe, Kashmiri minorities feel safe, whether it's Sikh, uh, uh, whether it's the, you know, the Valmikis who came to Kashmir to, to find work, unless and until those people feel safe, there's no really, you know, the, the, the removal of Article 370, the jailing of people like Yasin Malik is only going to be a firik victory. It's only going to be an incomplete victory. To complete this victory, it, it is very important to make sure that these people feel safe. So let me know if I'm missing anything out so far in um, in why the Kashmiri Hindus are protesting in Kashmir for the last few weeks. Yeah, you know, this is a very significant and important issue and something that the government has not really focused on, unfortunately, uh, uh, in the recent past. So uh, these killings of pundits really began yet again last year. And ever since the abrogation also, I, I believe at least 10 to 15 Hindus uh, if not more, have been killed. Uh, huh. And significant portion of that is Kashmiri Pandits. I remember uh, roughly, if I can take, Ajay Pandita was killed, Rakesh Pandita was killed, most recently Rahul Bhatt was killed. But before this, there was this uh, chemist, Makhan Lal Bindru, who huh. was killed. And uh, around around the same time in October last year, Supender Kaur, a Sikh principal of a school, was killed. And her teacher, a Hindu from Jammu, Deepak Chand, was also killed. So these are some of the names that I remember. Uh, so these people have been mercilessly killed by terrorists, of course, of course, only because they were Hindus. They were selectively yes. targeted, their identities were checked repeatedly, and then they were shot by these terrorists of uh, Pakistan. So, and of course, common Kashmiri Muslim terrorists and the Pakistani terrorists. So, uh, you know, these, uh, speaking about the PM package employees, uh, you know, this was a scheme that was introduced by Prime Minister, uh, you know, Manmohan Singh in which uh, 6,000 do- jobs were allocated. I think it was initially 3,000 and then later 6,000, if I'm not wrong. And they, it was said that Kashmiri pundits in Jammu who are economically weaker and do, who do not have much uh, you know, uh, economic means uh, will, have, uh, will get these jobs. So slowly and steadily, these transit camps were created for these employees in Kashmir, in Sheikhpura, in Vesu, uh, in uh, Kulgam, you know, Pulwama, Badgam, Baramula, in several areas, several districts of Kashmir. And there was a clause in that PM package that once you're selected for it, you have to go to your home district to work. If I am from Shopia, I'll go to Shopia mm. to work. If I'm from Baramula, I'll work in Baramula. If I'm from Badgam, mm. I'll work in Badgam. So some of the districts are far and wide. There are, you know, uh, villages that are so uh, in the interiors. And uh, it is difficult for Kashmiri Hindus to stay there because, uh, you know, imagine there's a one lakh population all around and there's one single Hindu or two Hindus that are staying there. So it is difficult to stay there. You can't trust many people around. And yeah. of course, uh, there is a support of the overground network to the terrorists in that area. And of course, this these Hindus can be easily identified. So these Kashmiri Hindus right now, because of these killings, have been demanding that they should be transferred to the Jammu division. Anywhere in Jammu, mm-hmm. but not in Kashmir. Because they fear for their lives. They came, of course, because they did not have any economic means and they had to uh, because there was a bond to be signed that you will only work in Kashmir. But now 
uh, the demand is that they cannot stay anymore because today it was Rahul Bhatt, tomorrow it can be anybody else that can mm. be killed. And they do not feel safe at all uh, yeah. in these ghettos or transit camps that have been made uh, because already there's a lot of rhetoric and uh, a lot of targeted killings uh, that are continuing. Uh, so they, these uh, people have been protesting for the last two weeks. I think today is the 15th or the 16th day of the protest. Yeah where they are not joined their jobs in the last two weeks. They are continuously protesting in all their transit camps and demanding foolproof security, demanding that they be shifted to Jammu and, of course, larger compensation to Rahul Bhatt's family. So yeah. I think the governor uh, uh, yesterday or day before yesterday met uh, these protesters and had a long chat with them. I think the governor should have gone on the first or the second day itself. He didn't have to wait for the last yeah. two weeks. And the government also needs to show some compassion and empathy. You know, these are Hindus that have suffered terrorism. These are Hindus who have lost their near ones and loved ones in this 30 years of terrorism in Kashmir. Now, these are Hindus that have lost all their property in Kashmir, uh, mm. all their hope. Uh, they uh, lived in camps, in shabby camps, in inhabitable camps in Jammu, in sweltering heat. And uh, they do not have any economic means as well. So you need yeah. to show some kind of compassion to them and some leniency and at least for the you know i'm not saying permanently but at least for some time till there is this you know fear in them they should be shifted to jammu the government employees can be you know transferred again to kashmir but yeah. as of now if they do not feel comfortable and fear for their lives the least that the government of india can do is shift them to the jammu division and yeah. i think that would be the least and these are hardly a few hundred employees that we are talking about it's not a huge number uh, that is there and uh, it would be important for you know intermixing also to happen. There will be there should be people from Jammu who should be in the bureaucracy or in the uh, you know mid level and lower level uh, jobs, government jobs. Mm. Uh, that's how I think the transformation will happen when people from Jammu, the Dogras, the Sikh, and others work in Kashmir and the Kashmiris also to an extent work in Jammu uh, or maybe rest of the country. And mm. here I want to talk about the uh, the uh, you know the IPS, the Agmut Kader that has been given to the IPS in Jammu and Kashmir. And that means that police officers who have uh, the Agmut Kader or who are from JNK, the erstwhile JNK Kader, can move out to this Agmut Kader. That means anywhere in Arunachal, Mizoram, Goa, Delhi, all these union territories. So I think it's an exceptional and important exercise for Kashmiri mm. police officers to work in places like Goa, Mizoram and New Delhi. Yeah. And that will give them huge exposure of how life is beyond Kashmir. So uh, I think these... Uh, things need to be implemented by the government of India. A larger society change needs to be there. And of course, the continuing policy of no tolerance towards terrorism is important and significant and needs to be continued. So let me ask you this, because some people have suggested certain kinds of solutions to this problem, because one of the solutions, you know, people have obviously said that jo Kashmiri Hindus hai, shift them to Jammu and let them work in Jammu for the time being while you sort out the situation in Kashmir, because this is an untenable, untenable way of surviving. They are surviving in Kashmir right now. They're, they are surviving. They're not living, really. I mean, this is no kind of a life where you're always, you know, every single day, because you don't know if you'll come back or not. So some people have suggested that to, to contain the situation, there are multiple things that can be done. The situations that people have said is that bifurcation of uh, Jammu and Kashmir into Jammu and Kashmir and giving statehood to Jammu first and settling the Kashmiri Hindus in Jammu and giving them the state's rights over there for the time being uh, while the Kashmir situation, you know, the government can take longer to sort out the Kashmir situation. And in the meantime, the political aspects of, you know, aspirations of Jammu and the Kashmiri Hindus are taken care of there because okay. Even if statehood, let's say, is returned to Jammu and Kashmir in the whatever, however many years, you could very well see a situation where the Kashmiri, you know, the Kashmiri Muslims and certain, let's say, vested interests in Jammu can get together and constantly repress whatever political aspiration that the that Jammu might have. Sim that uh, you know the Kashmiri Muslims are a majority in that state. So. What do you what do you think about uh, that particular possible solution? You know, of course, this question is better answered by the people in power, uh, the government of India and the BJP particularly, 
because it's up to them. Uh, you know, if they've thought that Jammu should get a statehood, and there's been a campaign of sorts from Jammu because they have been discriminated upon time and again, mm. and that, that's an open fact. So, if the government of India or the national security apparatus or the BJP thought that statehood should be given, then it would have been given on 5th August 2019. Mm. I do not think that they strategically think it's the right decision. Uh, that's why I believe, and in my communication also with people in the national security apparatus, they fear that once Jammu gets statehood and Kashmir is, uh, you know, separate again, then Kashmir will be further alienated and cornered completely. And yeah. it cannot be sustained in, in, in a larger, uh, you know, sense. And uh, seeing the broader picture and the larger public interest and sovereignty of India and constitution and, of course, external threats like Pakistan and China as well, mm. uh, Jammu and Kashmir will have to be unfortunately together. This is yeah. what I hear when I speak sure. to you know people in power. So one has to see, you know, in times to come how things develop. But, mm. you know, delimitation has happened recently, which was pending for a very long time, which is positive. And I believe the BJP, if at all, it conducts elections. I don't know if elections will at all happen this year. Mm. I do not know if they will happen next year or when they will happen. But whenever they will happen, the BJP's aim, I personally believe, uh, would not be first to enter an alliance with National Conference and PDP. Mm. It would be to have a Hindu chief minister. Mm. Uh, Many would say that, no, I think the BJP has changed. The BJP knows uh, how Jammu and Kashmir is complicated. I don't think so. I think 5th August 2019 was a red letter day and a boundary was set on that particular day Mm. that the kind of politics that emanated from Kashmir, the kind of politics that emanated from New Delhi for Kashmir has to change. So Mm. I think the BJP will only go into elections when they are confident that a Hindu chief minister will be there. That's my personal belief. Interesting. Secondly, we have seen uh, several NC and PDP leaders break up from their political parties. From PDP, we saw several people leaving and creating an Apni party. There's already a people's conference uh, that is fighting against both these dynasties. Mm. Uh, we have, of course, senior NC leaders, including Devinder Rana from Jammu, who recently jumped ship and joined the BJP. He's one of the closest uh, you know, Man Fridays of both Farooq Abdullah and Omar Abdullah. Mm. Will we see more people leaving these political parties, creating their own political parties or joining the BJP or Congress? What role will Gulam Nabi Azad play? Uh, you know, he is one of the G23 leaders, uh, rebels within the Congress party. Yeah. Somebody who is uh, known as a Kashmiri, but he's originally from Jammu uh, and, you know, in the upper reaches of Jammu. So uh, it will be an interesting political uh, fight in Jammu and Kashmir. But as I said, I don't think, uh, at least that's my belief, or you could say that's my hope, that the BJP has tested waters with the BDP. Mm. And burned their hands miserably. So I don't think they will go into that experimental mode again. They have had, uh, you know, alliances with the NC also in the past, where Omar Abdullah was, of course, uh, uh, in Delhi as well. So I I think they have tested waters both with PDP and NC. And of course, they will be getting intelligence reports of what and how these people are involved in corruption, uh, some kind of radicalization and extremism as well how this autonomy and self-determination card was being played to fool the common Kashmiris time and again and keep them engaged. Mm. So we'll have to wait and see how the political future and democracy in Jammu and Kashmir really shapes up. But uh, of course, these fault lines will remain. Jammu will continuously demand a statehood. Jammu will have a problem with this Islamist and the Kashmiri hegemony that's happening. The Kashmiri Hindus and Pandits will continuously protest and stake their claim on the land of their forefathers. Uh, the Kashmiri Pandits, of course, have been demanding a separate homeland, mm. uh, Panun Kashmir, in the Kashmir Valley. Will that be feasible if, if at all uh, in the current uh, scheme of things? Mm. How will the Jammu and Kashmir government or the government of India ensure a return and rehabilitation of Kashmiri Pandits? Because as of mm. now, that's not possible at all. You know, every politician may speak about rehabilitation of Pandits and how governments have failed. But how can rehabilitation really be possible? when terrorism is still continuing. I, for instance, you know, live in Noida and uh, have settled here in the last 30 years. Uh, Why will I suddenly one day realize that, you know, I need to go back, uh, of Mm. course, land of my forefathers where, you know, emotions are there, 
I feel connected to that land. I whenever on professional assignments, I go there, I visit the temples, I visit my erstwhile home. But the problem is that terrorism is still there. I fear for my life yeah. whenever I'm there. I am given security not just in Jammu and Kashmir but in Delhi as well. So uh, yeah. when Kashmiri pundits still fear for their lives when they go to Kashmir, they do not feel comfortable. They feel this kind of an ecosystem is still there. This kind of hatred towards the minority Hindus. Yeah. So rehabilitation is out of question. You may call this kind of a job package a rehabilitation, but you will be fooling yourself. This yeah. is not rehabilitation. I mean, that's that's definitely not rehabilitation. I completely agree. That's yeah. basically just sending the lamb to the slaughter. That's that's what it is. Absolutely, absolutely. So Kashmiri pundits, as part of these job package, are sitting ducks. Basically, you know, yeah. uh, it was earlier somebody else. Now it was Rahul, but tomorrow it will be another person, and condemnations will happen. There will be a few protests and media chatter and prime time discussions, and everything will be over. But Yes, the government in India has shown the willingness, has shown the political intent on several issues regarding Kashmir in the recent past. Then on justice and on rehabilitation, they should do more. And that will only happen for now. You help the PM package employees. You uh, do a fast track for the Yasin Malik case, send him to the gallows. You set up a truth, truth and reconciliation commission or a fact-finding commission for the Kashmiri pundits, what happened in 1990. Mm. And at least tell the people because the Kashmiri pundits also need a closure to a certain extent. And that closure will only come when you formally recognize that it was a genocide, that it was an ethnic cleansing, that injustice was done. It was a forced exodus that had mm. happened because of Islamist terrorism, because of terror groups like JKLF and Hezbollah Mujahideen who were funded by Pakistan. And mm. the, it was Kashmiri Muslims who killed Kashmiri pundits, while Kashmiri pundits did not pick up the gun, not a single person. Yeah. So these are facts that the government of India fact-finding committee will have to someday speak. It may happen years from now, just mm -hmm. like, you know, Yasin Malik conviction is happening 32 years after mm -hmm. the crimes were committed. So I don't know when, when it will happen, but that is how the trajectory should be. Do you think a feasible solution, another solution that has been suggested by a lot of people, and this is a, they've suggested it as a temporary measure, is, you know, enclaves within Kashmir where uh, not necessarily like a Panun Kashmir, which is like a separate state by itself, but like an enclaves within Kashmir where Kashmiri Hindus can be settled along with, you know, serving uh, army people, ex-servicemen as well. And these provided with a decent amount of land, provided with arms, provided with security. So it is at least an area where Kashmiri Hindus can be resettled, they can work there, they can feel relatively safe there because right now there's a situation where, you know, even the government says, oh, we abrogated Article 370 because we want the state to develop, we want extremism to go away and for the state to develop, we need businesses to come in and put roots in Kashmir and give people jobs and things like that. But again, right now, businesses you would imagine would be scared to set up in Kashmir because they're like, yeah, be you know, people are still getting killed every single day. How safe will me and my employees are going to be if we go and put these people up in Kashmir? So people are saying if you create those enclaves, then those also serve as base of operations for various businesses to then set up. And eventually you can have Kashmiri Muslims come and work for those businesses as well. And then realize that yeah, this is a much better way to live rather than, you know, just take a stone and eat army. Se maar khao. What do you do? You feel like that's a feasible situation? Do you feel like that's something, you know, rather than providing like a separate state and bifurcating, trifurcating Jammu and Kashmir, this is a better temporary solution that might be feasible? Somewhere in the middle. I personally hmm. believe that, of course, logically speaking, that this homeland, Panun Kashmir, may not be something that the government of India can find achievable or doable. Hmm. Again, uh, enclaves, separate ghettos, separate enclaves is something that the Kashmiri pundits uh, will not feel comfortable with because these will again be enclaves where, you know, uh, safety will be an issue. And, you know, mm. these PM package employees are also in these separate uh, enclaves and ghettos. My, uh, at least, idea, if not a solution right now, is only that there should be a patch of land, a patch of land which is several kilometers long, which can be allocated. And uh, at least a few hundred kilometers, you know, uh, huge. And in that huge patch of land, 
uh, this community needs to be resettled, along with, of course, ex-servicemen and foolproof security provided by yeah. the, um, you know, JNK police or the Sec Central Paramilitary Forces or the Indian Army. Only then, I think there will be some, uh, you know, forward movement. I personally do not feel, and that can be a patch of land where, of course, the initial help comes from the, you know, union government. But of course, if there are people, you know, uh, within uh, the community who can afford, they can buy a patch of land or they can build their own houses as well, uh, you know, to settle. Because, you know, there are people, Hindus who mm. are well settled, who are businessmen or business tycoons, who have places in Gulmarg or Pehelgam or other places. So instead mm. of Gulmarg, Pehelgam or other places, they can invest there as well. So this economic revival uh, also needs to be uh, thought parallelly with, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, resettlement. So if they plan these ghettos in several other, several districts, I don't think people will be comfortable with that idea. Yeah. And if they want a larger population to return slowly, that will only happen on a particular piece of land and yeah. each family being given some kind of an initial help and compensation and economic revival also being planned around that area. Yeah, it, it seems like that the most sort of feasible way to go about it. You know, the, when I when I said enclave, I did mean sort of that larger piece of lawn land, not just like a small neighborhood in some town somewhere. I think, yeah, a large piece of land where the resettled Kashmiri Hindus can be provided with, you know, land, other like ex-service people are settled there, servicemen are serving, you know, currently serving servicemen are settled there as well to provide an extra layer of protection population there businesses can come set up there so like could be probably the best of the options that is available to the government in terms of like resettling the Kashmiri Hindus because as much as good faith Muslim leaders and youth leaders in Kashmir say Ki we want our Kashmiri Hindu bhai band to come back at the end of the day it's not just their word you know there is there are also in an infiltration of terrorism in Kashmir that's just not going to appear overnight however much these leaders want it to go away. So some kind of a common, you know, middle ground needs to be found. Do you think this is something that the government might entertain, you know, that, that piece of land little idea that we talked about? Uh, you know, I was looking down to my phone because for the last 10, 15 minutes, I'm receiving messages that another person has been killed in Kashmir. So I'm just Again? trying to confirm this information. Oh my yeah. God. And uh, uh, apparently a lady in central Kashmir has been killed, uh, an actress who is famous. I'll confirm once the police confirms to me. Anyways, wow. uh, this is unfortunate. But, yeah. uh, you know, talking about the plan that you were speaking about, the government of India has been in talks. You know, yeah. this has not been made formally, uh, you know, available or publicly available. But I believe sure. they have been thinking of something about resettlement and rehabilitation, whether it's feasible, whether a huge patch of land can be allocated uh, if the land is allocated, then how can uh, the pundits feel safe to return and how economically viable will that uh, entire uh, thing be? So, uh, you know, whether this happens uh, immediately mm. or not uh, is something that uh, the government of India will have to decide uh, how soon they can come up with this plan. And then the implementation of the plan is also something uh, that needs to be seen. But there are multiple challenges that the Gash government has in Kashmir. One is, of course, a political mm. democratic challenge where, of course, they have a left-wing governor, a very capable person, Manoj Sinha, at the helm of affairs right now, a very honest person, mm. uh, somebody who goes by the book and is very strict with his work. But uh, uh, it is now upon them when the elections can happen. When mm. can the system be completely you know, safe to go towards elections? Because... Already there's been a lot of corruption in Kashmir. Already there's been a lot of this kind of a, uh, you know, terrorists and radicals and politicians being in cohorts uh, about this entire agenda. And uh, uh, so it will be completely about gum on government of India to decide how, when and how soon will they be able to make this kind of an implementation. But one thing that I can confirm to you is that, yes, at the very highest level, they have been thinking, at least, uh, mm. bureaucrats and politicians of if there is a rehabilitation, how can that really happen? Perhaps mm. they do not feel that immediately that can happen. And that's why there's not much chatter about it or confirmation. But uh, otherwise, 
uh, there have were some steps that were taken. A revenue court was set up recently, and the government mm. of India said that those people whose properties have been occupied by locals or others illegally, they can reach out to those revenue courts with documents and their petitions, and uh, easily uh, those lands or those batch of property or agricultural orchards, etc., can mm. be taken back. So these are steps that have been taken uh, that that have helped to a great extent. But as I said, always that uh, you know. This is too little, too late. That has been done. A lot more needs to be done, and with consistency. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do agree, and uh, I think I I hope the government uh, has a plan because the news that you just told us as well. You know, this this situation is isn't necessarily sustainable for a very long time because the status quo. I don't think it's good for anybody. I think it's only good for the radical elements within the Kashmir Valley. I think that's the only; those are the only people that benefit from the status quo. Something needs to change, and I hope that uh, it changes quickly. This government has shown that they are capable of taking decisions when they need to, and I hope that they can take some more decisions to improve the status of the the Kashmiri Hindus in Kashmir and and the rest of the you know the all the rest of Kashmiris in Kashmir as. And again, once again, uh, Aditya, I want to thank you for taking time out today and coming on the show. I know you're a busy guy; you got a lot going on. So, I always appreciate when you can make some time to come and talk to me on the show. Thank you so much, Sham, and I'm glad this is perhaps the third time uh, you know I'm joining you. Uh, it's great that you're highlighting these issues because uh, the conversation is important. Uh, that I always say, and people like you who are you know instigated these debates. and spreading awareness it does not matter how many people listen to us it could be 10000 20000 50000 uh, people but those people uh, who will know about kashmir a little more the reality and perhaps then spread this information further is very important so thank you very much for raising these issues very boldly and honestly oh well, thank thanks to you as well and i appreciate it again guys uh, you know where to follow the Aditya- and go follow him on twitter i'll leave the link to his uh, twitter bio in the description of this video as well like today's video make sure to leave a like subscribe share all of that fun abuses both in the comments as well everything helps the algorithm uh the clip from this uh, podcast will be available later on in the day as well uh as usual make sure to join us on thursday tomorrow for our uh, podcast with kushal and abhijit So, if you want to follow, if you want to stay updated to all the latest uh, content that we're putting out on the show, make sure to subscribe and press the bell icon as well, so you get notified. Some people were telling me that you're not getting notified whenever a new podcast is coming. Make sure to press that bell icon as well. Other than that, we'll see you next week. Uh, well, so see you on Thursday for the main podcast. And until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.